Good morning, everyone. So today is the last class of head and neck. We are going to study ear. Now, all of us have experienced ear ache or ear pain sometimes in our lives. So to understand the importance of the anatomy of ear, let's start again with a case scenario. So this elderly gentleman who has a chronic history of ear infections goes to a junior doctor with the complaints of pain in the ear. Now, this doctor fails to elicit this history from him that there is ear infection, which he's had repeated episodes of ear infections from his childhood. Now, when he says, Mere kaan mein dard hai, he says, Chalo, let's examine. He examines and he sees that there is ear wax. And he says, okay, let me perform a, pro a procedure called ear syringing in which I will remove this ear wax. Done. And then he packs off this gentleman with some antibiotics and painkillers. Now, after a few days, his pain persists in spite of the antibiotics as well as the painkillers. And he sees and he notices a swelling which has developed at the back of his ear. He also sees his wife notices that when he smiles, the left side of his face actually does not show any emotion. So that tells you where we are going. Now, they go back to his his ENT surgeon, who has been examining him forever, uh, from, for a long period of time. So now he, they go back to their particular surgeon and he orders a CT scan. In the CT scan, he notices that, yes, there is a ruptured tympanic membrane. The ossicles are lost, which is because of the chronicity of his uh, infection. But he also notices that this time, look at this structure. Look at it on the right side and look at it on the left hand side. On the right side, this is the mastoid. You can see the air cells very nicely defined. But on the left side, as you can see in this particular picture, that there is uh, opacity in it and the air cells seem to be opaque. So as a result, translucent, there is an infection which has set in, which has also moved backwards towards the mastoid process. So to understand cases like this, to understand what are the connections which are present between ear, why earache travels, uh, earache is also felt in the um, um, tongue, we also feel pain in the ear taking place, which may be uh, referred to various other areas of our body, we need to understand the anatomy of the ear. So the competencies which we will be covering are, Describe and identify the parts, blood supply and nerve supply of external ear. Describe and demonstrate the boundaries, contents, relations and functional anatomy of middle ear and the auditory tube. Now the auditory tube you already covered with Dr. Anita, so I'm not going to go into details of that. Describe the features of internal ear. A number of those features we'll discuss here, but a large part of it will also be discussed in neuroanatomy. Explain the anatomical basis of otitis externa and otitis media and explain the anat anatomical basis of myringotomy. The ear is the organ of hearing and balance and is divided into parts. The external ear consists of the auricle and the external acoustic meatus. The auricle gathers the sound waves and transport and uh, it is direct uh, and uh, tr transmits them through the external acoustic meatus towards the tympanic membrane this tympanic membrane oscillates it divides the ear the external ear separates the external ear from the middle ear the middle ear houses the ossicles the ossicles vibrate with the sound waves and this vibration is thereafter passed on to the internal ear the internal ear consists of the cochlea, the vestibule and the semicircular canals. You are aware that the cochlea is the organ for hearing, while the vestibule and the semicircular canals are involved in balancing. The external ear. So the two parts of the external ear are the auricle and the external acoustic meatus. The auricle has a lateral surface and a cranial surface. The lateral surface has elevations and depressions. Corresponding to these depressions are the eminences which are present on the cranial surface. You've already done these in your initial classes, but a quick recap. This is an outer rim which is called the helix. The helix starts at a root which is known as the crust of the helix. Parallel to the helix is this antihelix which divides superiorly into a superior crust and an inferior crust. In between them is the triangular fossa. Between the 
antihelix and the helix is present a gutter which is known as the scaphoid fossa but the largest depression which is present in the ear in the on the lateral surface of the ear is known as the concha the concha is divided by the crux of helix into two parts a simba concha which corresponds to the supramedial triangle which you saw on the lateral surface of the uh, skull this further leads on to the mastoid antrum and below here is the cavum concha which leads into external acoustic meatus the cavum concha is uh, protected by the tragus and right opposite the tragus on the antihelix is a projection which is known as the antitragus in between them is the intratragic notch on the cranial surfaces are eminences which are corresponding to the scaphoid fossa to the triangular fossa as well as to the concha the entire auricle is made up of a single piece of yellow elastic cartilage the slide of uh, cartilage elastic cartilage which you see in your histology is that of the auricle and if you look at it carefully you will be seeing the uh, skin which is lining it on both sides so you'll be able to identify that elastic cartilage slide is actually belonging to the ear but in your exam you will still identify it as elastic cartilage now the elastic cartilage is a single piece of cartilage which is present makes the entire skeleton of the ear except in the area of the lobule which is this fatty area below as well as in the area which is present between the tragus and the crust of the helix which is known as the incisura terminalis now there is a lot of uh, uh, applied anatomy which is associated with the external ear so uh, this area the lobule is as but more importantly the yellow elastic cartilage is used in a large number of the elastic cartilage is used in a large number of reconstructive surgeries when when we have to repair or make parts of the nasal ala or the middle ear the lobule is also used as a, a site from which blood samples can be taken place take can be taken then in this space which is present between the crust of the helix as well as the tragus this is the incisura terminalis this area is utilized by the surgeons to enter into the uh, middle ear or as well as into the mastoid antrum then you are also aware, aware of the fact that um, uh, the uh, various uh, arch anomalies can result in misshapen ears which you have already seen in embryology now they on the helix there is this small tubercle which is known as the darwin's tubercle which is the vestige of the point of the ear which is seen in the lower animals and it is very well developed in our intrauterine life now most important part of the auricle is its nerve supply now to understand the nerve supply of the auricle one please remember your anatomy in front of the auricle we have the auricular temporal nerve coming to the auricle from the neck was the great auricular nerve and also behind near uh, in the posterior triangle coming from the posterior triangle is the lesser occipital nerve now anything which is auricle in it is going to be supplying the auricle right now to how to understand the part of the uh, auricle which is supplied by which nerve now hold your ear in such a fashion as if someone is pulling your ear to punish your ear now the entire area of the ear which is in your hand which includes this upper part this this of the lateral surface i'm talking about the lateral surface which includes the um helix it also includes part of the antihelix the lobule which is present between your uh, index finger if you're holding it the index finger as well as which is present um, between index finger and the palm your thumb should be on the cranial surface so this entire area of the ear which is in your hand presently is supplied by the great auricular nerve which is c2 c3 now the part which is anteriorly placed that is the crust of the helix the tragus this part is under the innervation of the auricular temporal nerve but obviously because the auricular temporal nerve is running around here then uh, the superior part of the cranial surface is with the lesser occipital nerve so the majority of the cranial surface is with the great auricular nerve the one which was in your hand and the upper part of the cranial surface is with the lesser occipital nerve so that finishes the cranial surface now let's focus 
back on the lateral surface. On the lateral surface, we've already discussed the part which is with the great auricular nerve, which was your heart. Mein tha. That was the uh, helix, that was the anti-helix, the, uh, the helix, the anti-helix, the lobule. All this area was with the great auricular nerve. Then the auricular temporal nerve had the crust of the helix. It had the tragus, this part of it. Now look at the concha. The concha receives its innervation from the auricular branch of the vagus. Do you remember? We had, when we talked about vagus, traced an auricular branch of the vagus. So, the deeper part of the auricle, that is the concha, is supplied, gets its sensory supply from the auricular branch of the vagus. So, the sensory supply of the auricle is with the great auricular nerve, the occipital nerve, the auricular temporal nerve and the auricular branch of the vagus. Parts of the concha also have been said to be supplied by the patient nerve. Now, this is very important because again, you are aware, you can feel in, it, feel in your own auricle that the skin of the auricle is adherent to the underlying cartilage and, a num and because of this adherence, there is no space, there is no place for things to expand. And if there is skin, there will be skin, mein hair follicles, bhi honge, sweat glands, bhi honge, sebaceous glands. Bhi honge. And when these glands or these hair follicles get infected, they will result in pain. Pain. They will cause. A, they will result in a painful condition because there is no place to expand. So as a result, you should be well aware of the sensory nerve supply of the auricle. Now, if you look at the blood supply of the auricle, let's finish that also here. Auricle ke pas apni named branch of the external uh, external carotid hair, which is the posterior auricular artery. So, the dominant blood supply of the auricle is the posterior auricular artery with supply also coming from obviously the superficial temporal and the occipital artery which are in relation to the auricle. Now, since the Olympics are going on, we cannot go without talking about sports injuries. Now, in rugby, in boxing, a large number of times there is a box which comes on or there is injury which takes place to the auricle. This results in hematoma which takes is formed by these blood vessels in the in these blood vessels which are supplying the auricle and this repeated hematoma formation and its uh, palliation results in formation of cauliflower ear. So, one of the common sports injuries which are seen in boxing individuals, boxing uh, sportsmen as well as in rugby players is cauliflower ear. Now, let's start with the second part of the external ear, the external acoustic meatus or the external acoustic canal. It is about 24 millimeters in length, that is about an inch long. It starts from the deepest part of the concha. This is the concha from the deepest part of the concha. And as you can see, it's not a straight tube. It initially moves, it initially moves upwards, backwards, and medially, and then downwards, forwards, and medially. So it consists of two parts, parts externa and pars medium. Also, when you look at this picture, you can see that the part of it is cartilaginous. That is, it is continuous with the cartilage of the ear. So, this part, which is its lateral one-third, is cartilaginous. And its medial two-third, which is about 16 millimeters, is bony in part. Now, the bones which are forming, which are forming its boundaries are, now look at this. If this is the ear, so this should be the uh, temporal bone. This is the squamous part of the temporal bone. And this is the tympanic part of the temporal bone. Tympanic part of the temporal bone. So, one first thing which we need to remember that it has bony part and cartilaginous part. Then also the other thing which we have to remember that it's not a straight tube. It is not a straight tube, but it is curved and is S-shaped. So now, when somebody wants to examine the ear, when the ENT surgeon or a doctor wants to examine the ear for otoscopic examination, to be able to see inside, we kya to see tympanic membrane. We have to straight the course. Karna padega. So in adults, this can be achieved by pulling the auricle upwards, backwards and laterally. 
In infants, however, it's a straighter tube. So it is just pulled straight backwards. Even when you look at your stethoscope, the ear of the stethoscope is angulated and is S-shaped to in order to allow easy movement of the stethoscope inside. Now, the entire canal, be its cartilaginous part or, a, or the bony part, you can see the maximum diameter, the greatest dimensions will be at the meatus. Thereafter, it narrows. The narrow part is the bony part. Apart from that, there are two constrictions which are present. One, which is present at the junction of the bony and the cartilaginous part. So this is the cartilaginous part, this is at the bony part. First is at the junction of the bony and the cartilaginous part. The other is about here, which is about 5 millimeters anterior to the tympanic membrane. 5 millimeters anterior to the tympanic membrane or it is better to remember that it is 2 centimeters from the bottom of the conca. Because here se why is it important? You must have seen your nieces, your nephews or your little brother, sister putting things in the ear. So in case the things are small, chuti chuti chuti, the chalk pieces, they can get, uh, they can, uh, this foreign body can get uh, stuck in these areas. What are these two areas? At the junction of the bony and cartilaginous part of 5 millimeters in front of the tympanic membrane, which is known as isthmus. This is 2 centimeters from the concha. This part is 2 centimeters, lying 2 centimeters from the concha. The external acoustic canal, just like the um, auricle, is also lined by skin. Now, in the cartilaginous part, the uh, skin contains hair, sebaceous glands and modified sweat glands which are known as cerumen. The skin of the bony part is continuous with the outer layer of the tympanic membrane. Now in this, um, the hair, now it has all the sebaceous glands, it has sweat glands as well as it has the uh, uh, hair follicles. Now the hair follicles, they may be boils which may take place like any other place like in the scalp we had sebaceous cyst due to hair follicle infection. Similarly, here we may have boils which are also known as furuncles and these furuncles are highly painful. So infections of the hair follicle here is known as furuncle. Now the cerumen or the ear wax which is secreted is important because it prevents maceration of the cartilage from taking place. Right? But a large number of times overactivity or poor hygiene results in the accumulation of this ear wax in the ear canal. Now the accumulate which we also saw in the gentleman which we were talking about. The accumulation of ear uh, canal, in the ear wax in this canal requires the process of syringing to take place because up to the ear wax it prevents, it impedes the transmission of sound waves and it causes pain number one and number two, it causes decreased hearing. Now to understand the entire procedure of syringing and the nerve supply, we first should do the walls of the canal. Now imagine the canal to be like a cube. So we have a roof. So this would be the roof of the canal. There is this opening which is present out here which is leading into the conca. This is the roof and this would be the tympanic membrane. Right? So this wall which we I'm just drawing right now, this would be the floor. Ye wali part this one would be the posterior wall. And the one which will be facing us would be the anterior wall. Now, if you look at this picture, the anterior wall has been removed. This is the roof. This is the floor. And this, which is multicolored wall, is the, um, which you can see out here, is the posterior wall. Here would be the tympanic membrane. And this is the concha. We've already done this innervation. We will come on to that later. Now, anteriorly, Anterior to the external acoustic meatus, now imagine in your body, is going to be present out here. Anteriorly, out here was the pyrotic gland. And also here is the TM joint. This is where the condyle of the uh, mandible is going to be there. So there is anteriorly, it is related to the temporal, uh, to the temporomandibular joint. And inferior to it, out here is the pyrotid as well as part of it may be also present anteriorly. 
Why is it important? A blow on the chin would result the condyle to protrude into this condyle of the mandible to protrude into the external acoustic meatus. Now, superiorly, now this is the squamous part of the temporal bone and over that inside which will continue into the petrous part. Now, out here is the middle cranial fossa. Superiorly, it is related to the middle cranial fossa and uh, posteriorly, posterior to it, posterior to the external acoustic canal is present the mastoid process. Now, when we discuss the innervation, now we've already run. Remember, this was under the great auricular nerve. This was the innervation by the auricular temporal nerve and this is the auricular branch of the vagus. The same nerves get extended inside. That is the auricular temporal nerve as well as the auricular branch of vagus. So the roof and the anterior wall, which we cannot see, are supplied by the auricular temporal branch. The roof as well as the anterior wall are supplied by the auricular temporal nerve and the auricular branch of vagus supplies the floor as well as the posterior wall. Now another thing which I forgot to mention earlier was, now this is the S-shaped canal which we have talked about, right? And here this is the tympanic membrane. Oh, this has become too curved. Let me make it again. Now, this is our external acoustic meatus and this is the tympanic membrane. Now, can you see the tympanic membrane is obliquely placed? It's facing towards the flow. It is lying at an angle of 55 degree, number one. Now, as a result of this placement of this tympanic membrane, which is obliquely at an angle, the important thing to remember is that the floor and the anterior wall of the external acoustic meatus are longer, the floor and the anterior wall are longer because now imagine ye, ye itna jada ho gaya na, ye agar obliquely placed hai, to ye itna hi jada ho gaya, the floor and similarly the anterior wall are longer than the roof and the posterior wall by about 4 millimeters. So, this is due to the obliquity of the tympanic membrane which is lying at an angle of 55 degree. Now, let's discuss a very important question for anatomical basis that is syringing of ear. Our gentleman in the beginning of the class also got his ear syringed because there was ear wax which had accumulated which caused pain to him and also probably would have resulted in impeding the sound transmission. So for removal of the ear wax, the ear wax is flushed out by using warm water. Now we've just discussed the innervation. You're aware that the floor the floor as well as the posterior wall are supplied by the auricular branch of the vagus. Now, this is how, this is the direction of flow of water. That is, it's going towards the flow and as, as well as it would be hitting all the walls, but also the floor as well as the posterior wall. This would result in stimulation of the auricular branch of the vagus. Now, the vagus we know, till now we've understood, it supplies the pharynx, it supplies the larynx and it supplies the stomach. Now, irritation of the vagus could result in cuffing and vomiting by inner way because of these, these nerves also which get stimulated. And in worst case scenario, because the vagus also supplies the heart, it can irritate those nerves. This, those nerves can also get stimulated and it can lead to cardiac arrest. So there is an important question which that is why does syringing cause coughing, vomiting or cardiac, uh, cardiac arrest in certain patients. So for that you need to describe the nerve supply of the external acoustic meatus, what is being supplied. Then you need to tell us that the skin of the auricle uh, of the uh, canal con contains the ceruminous glands which produce wax. This wax when it gets accumulated it impends, it causes pain, impe uh, impedes the sound transmission. So syringing is a process of flushing out the ear wax using warm water. This could stimulate the auricular branch of vagus and vagus also supplies. So please draw the diagram of vagus supplying all these areas, what all areas it supplies and then explain to us why cuffing, vomiting and cardiac arrest can take place. Now the other important question which is asked is on the referred plane. Now in referred pain, now uh, now the walls of the uh, the roof and the anterior wall were supplied by the auricular temporal branch of the mandibular nerve. 
The mandibular nerve, you know, also supplies the lower jaw and the teeth by means of inferior alveolar nerve. And it gives rise to general sensation of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue by means of lingual nerve. Now, pain in mandibular nerve frequently moves from one branch to another. That is, it gets referred from one branch to another due to the, due to the process of an, uh, referred pain. Hence, in case the patient has toothache, it would involve the inferior of the mandibular of the uh, teeth of the mandible. It would involve the inferior alveolar nerve and the pain may be referred to the ear. And similarly, the ear pain may be referred to the tooth. The other option would be that there is carcinoma of the tongue, which causes the irritation of the lingual nerve. And this pain may also be referred to the ear. So the referred pain is important, is another important part, which we have to deal with that why auricular tempo, uh, why uh, pain from pathologies of the oral cavity can be uh, referred to the ear or why pain of the ear is referred to various other places, which we need to discuss. So our last ode to the Olympics is the otitis externa, swimmer's ear or surfer's ear. Chronic, expo uh, chronic infection of the external acoustic meatus due to prolonged exposure of water or to cold winds may result in inflammation and infection of the external acoustic meatus. Repeated infections would result in uh, bony growths taking place or hypertrophy of the underlying bone to take place. This would result in narrowing of the bony canal, uh, the bony part of the external acoustic meatus, resulting in pain as well as impeding the transmission of sound. So in a normal person, when you can see the eardrum so clearly, in people with otitis externa or swimmer's ear, we would be not able to see because of this bony hyper, uh, high, uh, extra bone overgrowth of the bone which is taking place, the eardrum would be not be seen clearly. Now, before we go on further to the tympanic membrane and the middle ear cavity, let's understand the placement of structures. Because once that is clear to us, we will be able to imagine and visualize the walls and the structures of the middle ear cavity better. The tympanic membrane, as you know, separates the external ear from the middle ear. Now, let's make a section. Please draw with me. Let's make the skull in such a way that we can see the cranial fossas. Obviously, we are making a 2D section. So, those in depth will not be easily perceived. But let's try out. So, this is the skull. Where we can see the interior of the skull. This would be the area of the nasal cavity. And here, laterally, is placed the auricle. Right. Now, within the cranial uh, cavity, you are aware that this is the petrous part of the temporal bone. And this here would be the squamous part. And somewhere here would be the squamotympanic fissure. Right. So, this would be the petrous part of the temporal bone like this. I'll make it on the other side. Then it will be easier for us to remember this. So this is the ear, this is the squamous part of the temporal bone. From here, is this would be the squamotympanic, uh, the, yeah, the uh, petrosquamous fissure. And like this here is the petrous part of the, this is entire the petrous part of the temporal bone, right? Here would be the placement of the trigeminal ganglia. And this would be the um, upper surface, which we are seeing of the petrous part. Now, this would be the foramen magnum and similarly, this would be the petrous part of the temporal bone on this particular side. Right. Now, the external acoustic meatus appears oval in a section. So, you remember this is like the view of the um, uh, this part which we were seeing, the um, CT scan which we saw earlier. So, this would be the external acoustic meatus and out here, it would be dilated to form the middle ear, right? This would be the external acoustic meatus. Here would be the middle ear. And in this here, more laterally, would be the internal ear structures. And here, in this wall, out here would be the internal acoustic meatus. 
So this is how when we look at the structures from above, we are going to be looking at these structures. But when we place in the ear, so this is the external ear, the helix, the crux of the helix entering into the area of the concha. This is the concha. And from the concha, so let's give it a better shape. From the concha starts the external acoustic meatus, which initially moves upwards, backwards and medially, and then downwards, forwards and medially. Right? Here would be the bony part, which is coming in, and above that, before that is all of it is cartilaginous part. Then this is the tympanic membrane, which is placed obliquely. The tympanic membrane which is placed obliquely at an angle of 55 degree. So this entire structure is the external ear. Now, internal to this or medial to the tympanic membrane is present a mucus lined cavity which is the middle ear. So here is the middle ear and within the middle ear is present the ossicular chain. So we draw the malleus, the head of the malleus its neck and then a handle which is coming from it. There is a lateral process out here and an anterior process here. Next to the malleus or more medial to the malleus is the incus with its body and here is its hand. Again the long process of the incus. This is the saddle shaped incudo Melilla, meliola joint, which is a saddle joint. Thereafter, this here, this process here, this one, this is the lenticular process of the incus to which articulates the head of the steps with after the neck. There are these are its two crura. And this is the foot plate of steps, which is present more uh, medially. This here is the incudo stepedial joint, which is a ball and socket joint. So obviously, as you're aware, the ossicles are going to be vibrating. So the articulations with, between them should be synovial joints to allow for this movement. Now more medially, that is now if we move more, this is here, the middle ear cavity. So we've come from the ear, external ear, gone through the external acoustic meatus and thereafter we have the middle ear cavity. This particular picture mein meatus jada bada lag raha, itna bada hai nahi. And then there is this middle ear cavity and then put here would be the internal ear. So now let's start drawing the structures of the internal ear and how they are going to be placed. So the internal ear is a membranous uh, sac which is filled with a fluid called endolymph and this membranous labyrinth of the sac is enclosed in a bony labyrinth which contains another fluid which has a composition which is similar to the CSF which is the perilymph and it is present out here in this particular part of the bone of the petrous part of the temporal bone. Now from the posterior aspect moving more anterior, oh, okay from the anterior aspect out here is the cochlea with its two and a half basal turns. Then comes the vestibule and thereafter are the semicircular canals. There is a lateral semicircular canal, a posterior semicircular canal and a more anterior semicircular canal. It is this, uh, these semicircular canals which are also forming impressions on the petrous part of the um, uh, uh, petrous part of the temporal bone which you read as the arcuate eminence. Do you remember? The arcuate eminence which is seen on the which is seen on the anterior surface of the petrous part of the temporal bone which is formed by this anterior semicircular canal. So this is the cochlea. This would be the area of the vestibule the lateral semicircular canal, the posterior semicircular canal and the anterior semicircular canal. These, uh, the, uh, post uh, the posterior and the anterior semicircular canals do make an impression. The anterior semicircular canal makes an impression called the arcuate eminence. More, more, more medially, this would be the site of the internal acoustic meatus which is in line with the external acoustic meatus and entering into it would be the eighth cranial nerve 
and the seventh cranial nerve right so more medially so this is how the structures are placed maybe not in this orientation but they are more uh, uh, they have a depth to it and they have more angulation to it but this is how the structures are going to be placed so the external ear which consists of the auricle then we have the external acoustic meatus the tympanic membrane which is obliquely placed which is separating these structures this is the middle ear cavity a part of the middle ear cavity is directly behind the tympanic membrane and the part of it is above it a part of it is below and most medially are the internal ear structures which are placed and then is the internal acoustic meatus now the other thing which you need to understand this was the squamous part of the temporal bone right i'm going to rub some of my markings you can keep them but i need some more place okay thereafter this is the petrous part of the temporal bone all these structures are lying in the petrous part of the temporal bone okay so this is the petrous part of the temporal bone and this part of the petrous part of the temporal bone is known as tegmen tympani right so this is the petrous part here again was the tympanic plate of the temporal bone and ye petrous part of the temporal bone mein aise jate hue hai now the other thing which you need to remember is that the middle ear cavity communicates with the nasopharynx by means of this auditory tube and you will see that this auditory tube the uh, the groove in which this auditory tube is running that is the sulcate tube is in relation to the petrous part of the temporal bone when you come to us in the uh, when we are doing the skull demonstrations we will be showing you that this is the area of the sulcate tube so this is somewhere like this that this particular bone is ending which is the petrous part of the temporal oops i will not label it here because i need this space again so this here would be the petrous part of the temporal bone now another part of the temporal ठीक है और ये यहां से अगर हम बोले तो ये ऐसे ऑडिटरी ट्यूब गोइंग टूवर्ड्स दी ने जो आप डिटेल में पढ़ चुके हो ठीक है ना दी अदर स्ट्रक्चर विच यू नीड टू रिमेंबर इज दैट ये जो टिम्पैनिक प्लेट है अगर हम उसको मूव मीडियली ट्रेस करेंगे यहां पर हमें दिखेगी इंटरनल जुगलर वेन एंड ही वुड हैव दिरोटेड artery internal carotid artery which is entering so this internal carotid artery sorry the internal jugular vein and the internal carotid artery which is entering into the carotid canal and somewhere here it is exiting out in the cranial fossa so the internal carotid artery is running here right and the uh, sigmoid sinus is here which is behind and then it's going down to form the uh, internal jugular vein out here posteriorly would be the mastoid process once you understand this placement thereafter my job further is lot more easier now let's start with the medial structures which are present of in the ear now the first structure which we will encounter is the tympanic membrane the tympanic membrane forms a partition between the external ear and the middle ear it is present in the medial wall of the external ear and in the lateral wall of the middle ear number 1 number 2 many books consider it to be a part of the external ear it is an oval semi transparent membrane the importance of its transparency is that because it is semi transparent as you can see in this picture we are able to visualize structure which are present interior to it it is obliquely placed at an angle of 55 degree as if it is collecting the sound waves from the uh, floor of the external acoustic meatus that we have already seen in the diagram previously now let's talk about its structure it is composed of an outer cuticular layer this is the outer cuticular layer which is continuous with the skin of the external acoustic meatus so this is the skin of the external acoustic meatus so the outer layer of the tympanic membrane so this is the 
histological structure, the outer layer of the tympanic membrane is continuous with the skin and is made up of stratified, the outer layer, stratified squamous keratinized epithelium, stratified squamous keratinized epithelium, which is hairless. And this forms the cuticular layer. Internal to this cuticular layer is present a fibrous layer which is made up of collagen fibers which are running radially as well as circularly. And more internally, it is lined by, uh, for the lack of the appropriate colors, I'm again using the same color, it is lined by the mucous membrane of the middle ear. This is the middle ear cavity and the mucous membrane of the middle ear which is ciliated columnar epithelium lines it. So we have three layers which are forming the tympanic membrane. These are the cuticular layer, the fibrous layer and then the mucosal layer. Now if you can see that it has a convexity. Every time we've drawn it, we've made a convexity which is directed medially. This convexity is because of the attachment of the handle of the malleus to the um, internal aspect or the medial aspect of the tympanic membrane between the mucosal layer and the fibrous layer. So again, if we were to draw, this is how we had drawn the tympanic membrane at the end of the external acoustic meatus, which was placed obliquely at an angle of 55 degree. Now here is the head of the malleus, its neck, then we have a lateral process and the handle of the malleus. The handle of the malleus is attached to the mucosal, is present between the fibrous and the mucosal layer and this point of maximum convexity which is formed because of the attachment of the handle of the malleus is known as the umbo. Okay, so that is where the handle of the malleus is attached. Number one. Now, the entire tympanic membrane itself, if you were to look inside this temporal bone, now can you see this internal part? Right there, the hole which you're seeing, the this, this part is known as the tympanic sulcus. And to this is attached our tympanic membrane. This tympanic sulcus is deficient superiorly. So it's like this. The part of the tympanic membrane which is attached completely to this part is known as pars tensa. From the ends of this tympanic sulcus, this is the tympanic sulcus, from the ends of this tympanic sulcus, move mucosal folds which are called malleolar folds. These are the malleolar folds. which attach to the lateral process of the malleus out here. There is a part of the tympanic membrane which is above it. And this part is known as pars placida. Right? So the tympanic membrane, as you can see in this picture also, when we are doing an otoscopic examination, you will see that a majority of the tympanic membrane is present in a ring-like structure, which is known as the tympanic sulcus. In the tympanic sulcus, which is present in the tympanic part, bone part of the uh, temporal bone. Now, this sulcus is deficient superiorly. So, here, from here, you have these malleolar folds, which are running towards the lateral process of the malleus. As a result, the part which is present below, which is attached to the tympanic sulcus is taut and is known as pars tensa. The part which is present cranial to it is known as pars placida. Now, what are the other differences which are present between the pars tensa and the pars placida? Number one, the pars tensa forms the majority of the tympanic membrane. The pars placida forms a small part of it. This is tense. This is comparatively, uh, uh, it is uh, flaccid and it, this vibrates, the past tensa vibrates with the uh, uh, with the sound transmission. On sound transmission, pars placida does not. Then it is uh, pars tensa is attached to the tympanic sulcus. We've already done that. Now the pars tensa histologically consists of all these three layers which we talked about. However, in the pars placida, the fibrous layer is missing.
right now because of its semi transparent structure we can see visualize the internal structure so what is this this is the handle of the malleus this is the lateral process this is the handle of the malleus and this is the point where the handle of the malleus is attached to the tympanic membrane the point of maximum convexity which is known as the umbo so this is the handle of the malleus more internally you can also see the long process of the incus so if we were to draw this is how the long process of incus was with its lenticular process right so this is what it was so this is the other structure which we can see on the on when on examination okay so the other thing which you have to remember is for a uh, better understanding the tympanic membrane is divided into quadrants now what are these quadrants so again this is the tympanic membrane these are the malleolar folds Okay, this is the pars densa and this is the pars flaccida. Now, for better understanding, we divide it into four quadrants so that we are able to make out our make our relationships. So, this out here would be the anterior inferior quadrant. This is the tympanic membrane of the left side. Anterior inferior quadrant. This would be the anterior superior quadrant. This is the posterior superior quadrant, and this would be the posterior inferior. quadrant so these are the four quadrants which are present these are the malleolar folds and more internally more medially running bit medial to the handle of the malleus out here is the corda tympani corda tympani nerve the corda tympani if you remember is a branch of the facial nerve and it is moving towards the anterior canaliculus to exit out from the middle ear cavity it enters the middle ear cavity at the posterior can from the posterior canaliculus and exits out through the anterior canaliculus so it is on its way to the anterior canaliculus and it is present medial to the handle of the malleus okay so and at the junction of the pars tensa and pars uh, uh, pars uh, flaccida so somewhere here would be the running tympanic membrane on the internal aspect then this would be the handle of the malleus which we would be seeing on the internal aspect and this would be the long process of incus which we can see at the internal aspect so on otoscopic examination when we were to perform an otoscopic examination in ent we would be able to visualize the tympanic membrane this is the past tensa part of it we would be also able to visualize the malleolar folds the posterior and the anterior malleolar folds then the handle of the malleus the point of maximum convexity which is the uh, umbo we will also be seeing the long process of the incus and all this is possible because it's a semi transparent structure which allows us to visualize the structures which are present medially in the middle ear when the light is directed obviously when you're uh, seeing in a canal which is like a tunnel you will be directing a light when this light from the uh, lamp is directed inside the ear a cone of light is seen which runs as you can see in the anterior inferior quadrant of the tympanic membrane and this pearly white structure a pearly white appearance of the tympanic membrane with a cone of light which is present in the anterior inferior quadrant or and or the five o'clock position so because it's a circular structure just like in histology we are uh, uh, we are comparing it to the uh, dial of a clock and we are looking at the various structures so this would be the five o'clock position this would be the five o'clock position of the dial and at the five o'clock position or the anterior inferior quadrant is present the um is present the uh, is present a cone of light in a normal tympanic membrane normal healthy tympanic membrane so these are the structures which we see in the tympanic membrane on otoscopic examination theek okay? hai so again so this is the tympanic membrane we these are the structures which we are seeing on on the inside you can see the corda tympani nerve which is running from the posterior canaliculus through the anterior canaliculus it will exit out and uh, thereafter you know its course you've already done it many times these are the various folds and this is the reflected cone of light which you can see in this when you see through an otoscope you should be able to draw that diagram 
of structure seen through the otoscopic examination. The nerve supply. Now, the same nerves which have been supplying the external acoustic meatus are going to be supplying the tympanic membrane. So, the majority of the tympanic membrane is supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve. Right? A greater part of the tympanic membrane is supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve and a small part that is so the, uh, which is in continuity with the roof and the anterior wall of the uh, external acoustic meter. So, and the small part in continuity with the floor and the posterior wall is supplied by the auricular branch of the vagus, the floor and the posterior wall of the external acoustic meters. So you have to take in the nerve supply from there, from the uh, external ear, Towards the external acoustic meatus and ultimately to the tympanic membrane, the same structures are supplied. The blood supply will be from branches of the maxillary artery and the branches of the uh, occipital artery will be supplied. Now for applied anatomy, so you will be talking about the otoscopic examination. Now, perforations of the tympanic membrane can be seen due to trauma. So, bachpan se aapko bola ja raha hai ki kaan mein koi bhi pointed cheese mat daliye. Why? Because it would perforate the tympanic membrane. That is due to trauma. The other way the tympanic membrane can get ruptured or perforate is through the infections of the middle ear. As we will see further on, we will discuss otitis media in greater detail that whenever there is a pressure, when if, if the middle ear, which is a closed cavity, uh, more or less closed cavity starts bulging in due to accumulation of pus it may the the uh, pus would need a place to get away from so when where will it get away from from the wall which is the weakest this wall is the weakest wall of the middle ear cavity you just see which is the tympanic membrane and as a result infections of the middle ear can bring about rupture of the tympanic membrane we'll discuss it again in a bit of in in a later time now mirroring that's the third aspect which we need to know before tympanic membrane. Now, the tympanic membrane is a lateral structure of the middle ear. So, it's more laterally placed, more externally placed. So, if we want to access the middle ear, incisions can be made in the tympanic membrane. So, this is a pathological tear or rupture. Now, we have jam ke tympanic membrane ko incise kar rahe hai and this incisions which are made in the tympanic membrane is known as meringotomy to access the middle ear structures. Now it is said that uh, uh, the anatomy books particularly say that the best site for incisions in the tympanic membrane is the posterior inferior quadrant. So you remember the quadrants which we had divided the tympanic membrane into? These were the four quadrants. We had the anterior inferior where we saw the cone of light, which in this case, if the tympanic membrane is ruptured, will be distorted. There is this anterior superior quadrant, the posterior superior quadrant, and the posterior inferior quadrant. So the anatomical thing is that because superiorly, at the junction of the pars tensa and the pars flaccida, corda tympani nerve is running. So, we don't want to go in the superior aspect. In the posterior inferior aspect, this posterior uh, aspect has the richest blood supply. This posterior aspect has a richer blood supply as compared to the anterior aspect. So, it is said that meringotomy or incisions in the tympanic membrane are made in the posterior inferior aspect of the tympanic membrane. Now, if you're going to make an incision, you should also have some idea of how the structures are placed inside in the uh, middle ear cavity. Just say, when incision are making form, this incision is made. Okay, if I'm making this incision, then the chances of making it, the chances of injuring things internal to it are less. So we should have an idea about which quadrant of the tympanic membrane is related to what structures. So it is said that the anterior superior quadrant is related to the auditory tube. So, inside it, deeper to it, would be the auditory tube. The anterior inferior quadrant, ke deeper aspect, pe carotid canal. Posterior superior quadrant is related to the ossicular chain. Obviously, you saw the uh, incus which was present out here, right? So, that means incus, tapes are all present out here. And the posterior inferior quadrant, so more deeper to the posterior inferior quadrant are present the promontory or the cochlear projections. So this is the projections of the deeper structures on the tympanic membrane. 